Good evening everyone, it's good to have you joining me once again this Wednesday evening for a little time of Bible study together. Tonight and for the next few weeks we're going to turn to one of those less familiar books of the New Testament. Indeed, one of the shortest with just one chapter and only 25 verses. It's the last book but one in the Bible, the powerful little letter of Jude. So you can be looking that up uh, just now because we're going to pray and then we're going to read just the first four verses of this letter and think a little bit about its message. So let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful to you again for the beauty of this day. It's been a joy to have the sun shining and this evening to have the sun streaming in the windows. Good also to know the gift of life that you have given us. And many of us can rejoice in just health and strength to have enjoyed this day. Even we've had the demands of the workplace behind us. We maybe are busy this evening with things of home and family. But thank you for this time just to come aside with you to pause and to meditate upon your word. To think about its message for our hearts and the challenge it would bring to us as people who love Jesus and want to serve him. We pray Lord God you would speak powerfully from this word of truth in the letter of Jude this evening and that through it you will encourage us as we live our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ answering his calling and living for his glory for it's in Jesus name we pray amen so let's turn then to the word of God and to the letter of Jude beginning to read at verse 1 Jude a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Christ, for Jesus Christ. May mercy, peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write, appealing to you to contend for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people, who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we know that God will bless the reading of his word for Christ's sake. Each time we read one of the New Testament letters, we can be sure that it was written with a specific objective in mind. And often that is to address challenges being faced by the Christian church, or indeed particular problems that have arisen within a local church fellowship. Indeed, often it's the problems that arise from within the Christian church, that pose a more immediate threat than do the pressures coming from without. And that is clearly the concern of Jude in this short little letter. He touches here on a number of themes that we will come to in due course. But it is clear from verse 3 that we've read, his main concern is to issue this particular appeal. To contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. Jude is probably writing in the early part of the second half of the first century AD. We don't have a definite date. But it seems clear that on the one hand, by this time there is a clearly established body of gospel teaching given to the church by Christ and by his apostles. Because that's what really Jude means when he speaks of, quote, the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. And the saints, of course, are simply the people of God, uh, not any particular special person, but they're believers. But he's talking here about the fundamentals of gospel teaching in which every Christian places their trust. And with that also then the outworking of that gospel teaching in the life of of believers as they live out their faith. Now I'll say more about this next time 
But for now, will you please note that whilst on the one hand there was this body of established apostolic gospel truth, on the other hand, enough time had elapsed in the history of the church that there were now those entering the church's life who were beginning to teach new things, things that were contrary to the teaching of Christ and his apostles. And this is whom Paul speaks of in verse 4. He says, For certain people have crept in unnoticed, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now again, we'll say more about this uh, in our next uh, study. But notice for now how this danger has entered into the church's witness. It hadn't come flooding in suddenly and unexpectedly and therefore overwhelming the life of the church. No, it had crept in, says Jude, unnoticed. And that is why the warning and advice given in Jude's letter continue to matter so very much today. Because no matter how strong and clear in their convictions a church denomination may be, or indeed a local church fellowship may be, we may feel very clear about ourselves and what we believe, the devil will always be looking for a way in, unnoticed, undercover almost, that he can use to hinder the church's witness. It's understandable, of course, that in post-Christian secular Britain today, Christians are very concerned about the rejection of their faith in the public square and, and how their moral standards and values are, 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 are scorned in, in wider society. It's understandable, therefore, that we be wary of the spiritual forces of evil at work outside the church and in the secular world. Yet Jude's great concern was much more about the potential dangers at work within the church's life, much more so than the dangers from without. And I do think that is also clearly still the, the major threat today. In Western society, at the present time, the witness of too many churches is compromised, not by threats of persecution and trouble from the secular world, though that may be on the horizon, but by those within certain churches who have embraced the beliefs and the morals of the world around them, believing perhaps that that will, will make them popular. And they've done so through all sorts of twisting of scripture and sometimes by claims to have new revelations that have taken them in this direction. I've heard godless and unbelieving people uh, say that we feel this is the way the Spirit of God may be leading us. And there's nothing to do with the Spirit of God. It's got everything to do with the corrupt imaginations of their own hearts. The revelation has not come to them from the Word of God, but from the devil. And what they call new light is really just old darkness that the devil has heated up and recooked and that they have now swallowed. But this evening, before we get into the meat of what Jude is saying in this letter, I think we should pause and look for a few moments just at the first couple of verses. You know, often the opening few verses in these New Testament letters, we're inclined to skip over as though they were simply mere words of greeting and introduction, when in actual fact they are more than that. They are there, given to us by God for a purpose. And so notice here in verse 1 firstly how Jude identifies himself. He says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. More literally in the original Greek, his name is not Jude, but Judas. 
And of course, there are a few men by that name mentioned in the New Testament. Most notoriously, of course, the traitorous disciple Judas Iscariot. But clearly, it isn't he who's writing this letter. So who is this Jude, the brother of James? Well, most Bible commentators are agreed that the one person that best fits fits the description is the Judas that is spoken of in Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, where where it speaks about Judas, who is not only the brother of James, but also the brother of Joseph and Simon. And those four brothers had as their parents Mary and Joseph, which made them, in fact, half-brothers of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And yet when Jude writes this letter, he doesn't play up this obvious, significant family relationship as if to say, listen to me because I'm Jesus' brother. Rather, with great humility, he describes himself as a servant of Jesus Christ. And maybe there's a very good reason for that. There was a time when even as part of Jesus' own family, Jude and his brothers, we are told in John 7 verse 5, did not believe. They didn't believe the message their their own half-brother was preaching. Now that changed, of course, radically subsequent to Jesus' resurrection because in Acts chapter 1 verse 14, uh, before Jesus ascends into heaven, we are read read of those who are gathered in the upper room and who are uh, joining the the apostles, rather after after Jesus' ascension into heaven, not before it, but after it, we read of those gathered in the upper room uh, and joining the apostles of Jesus uh, on that occasion were Jesus' brothers, and together they had gathered for prayer. There had been spiritual transformation in Jude's life. And now, He looked to his own half-brother, not as a preacher whose words he struggled to believe, but as one, in fact, who had now rescued him as a sinner from his sin, from the power of Satan, and had saved him and given him a new life and a new relationship with God. There had been spiritual transformation And now he looked to his own brother in a whole new way. And any authority that Jude had to speak to the church derived not from this family relationship to Jesus, but from his trust in Jesus as Lord. You know, I think it's worth saying in passing here that If you're someone who has a child in your family who has grown up into adulthood and has not yet embraced the faith that you taught them in childhood, do remember that your situation is just the same as was found in Jesus' own home and family. Jesus taught the gospel, the good news of the kingdom and his own brothers for quite a while did not believe. It took a miracle of God's grace to change things. And it's no different for you or for me or any one of us. Only that miracle of grace will change the heart. Not you, not me, not anyone else. But secondly then, who does Jude write to? We're not told exactly who his audience were. There's no particular church mentioned here, no particular location And that means that he may have been addressing an issue that had arisen in one very particular area or it may have been an issue that was more widespread in the church across a wider area and Jude is addressing his letter more generally to the church in a number of places. One thing is certain, his message that he has spoken has in every generation been relevant And it will continue to be relevant and will continue to speak into the life of the church year upon year until the day the Lord returns. Because the issues that Jude alerts us to really don't go away. But what we do know about the people to whom he writes is about their standing before God. Jesus begins here with words of encouragement and reassurance in verse 1. As 
he reminds them of who they are and how they stand before God. Mindful that he's about to ask them to do something courageous and to contend for the faith that they profess. He speaks here to those who are, he says, the called who are beloved in God the Father and are kept for Jesus Christ. In the first instance then they are people who have answered God's calling. People have made a conscious response to the call of the Lord Jesus in the gospel. And therefore the origins of their faith are not simply within themselves. The origins of their faith lie in the call and the power of God that has opened their eyes and opened their hearts to receive the word of Christ. And so day by day, as they live out the Christian life, they remain under that same powerful calling to follow him. Even as they are beginning in the church around them to see some people who have professed faith now sadly falling away. The call of God upon the life of a Christian is never just something that is about the past. Oh, I remember the day and hour and the night when God called me to saving faith. I remember the night so well. Wonderful to testify about that. But the calling of God is also something that remains with us all through our lives until the, the day when finally he calls us home to glory. And importantly in the context of this letter, it is a call to come apart from this world's sin to a new life of holiness in Christ. I like that hymn. It's a, it's a relatively modern hymn written by a guy called Vernon Hyam that says, Have you heard the voice of Jesus softly pleading with your heart? Have you felt his presence glorious as he calls your soul apart? With a love so true and loyal, love divine that ever flows from a saviour righteous royal and a cross that mercy shows. And the third verse begins with these words, Have you heard the saviour calling all to leave and follow him? Have you felt his person drawing with compulsion lives to win? You see that calling of Christ that not only calls us to salvation but calls us to walk on and to witness on for him. Then secondly, we are told here that they are beloved in God the Father. Those who will be called to contend for the faith must know that though they may need indeed to face down people who will resent them and to challenge those who will mock them and who will mock the faith that they profess, they will be dealing with people who may seek to belittle them and scorn them and say, the message you believe, that's out of date. That old gospel message that, that Jesus preached. We, we've got something new to say. Your history, you're, you're um, on the wrong side of history, they would say today. And yet all the while, those who are scorned for holding fast to the faith must remember that at the same time, they remain held fast in the strong covenant-keeping love of God. God's love is never a love that's fickle or fading or unreliable, but one that is as solid and sure to today as it was yesterday and as it will be tomorrow and always. And as such, therefore, they are also people who are, we are told, kept for Christ Jesus. This is the theme, in fact, to which Jude will return once again right at the end of his letter. After he has set before them the, the challenges of of his message, he will say at verse 24, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority. Right at the beginning, right at the end, he reminds him, you are a people kept by the power of God and the love of God, kept for Christ Jesus. But how vital it is that as they are called upon in the tough days to take a stand for Jesus and the gospel, they remember not only Jesus' saving, but his keeping power. And how we need that over and over again ourselves, don't we? We need to come back always to the words of Jesus in John 
Chapter 10, verses 27 to 30. Many of you will know these words very well. Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So these are people who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Christ Jesus. The final thing in these introductory verses of Jude's letter is simply this. What does Jude pray for his readers? Verse 2 has the answer. May mercy, peace and love be multiplied to you. I think that's not just a wish on Jude's part. It is his prayer for them. They are things that these believers have already received in their conversion to Christ. Mercy, peace and love. But Jude's prayer is that knowing more of these things and knowing these things in abundance will be what God provides for them every day. That they are fully equipped to rise to the calling that they have in Christ and to this challenge once more to contend for the faith. They would not be in a right relationship with God at all were it not for his mercy, his, his willingness not to treat them as their sins deserve, but to forgive them. That's what mercy is about. But these are people who, like you and like me, will some days be fine getting it tough. We will struggle with our faith. And sometimes we will sin in our lack of faith. And we will fail. And we will need over and over again to know the constant presence of God's abundant mercy. And the pledge of God's forgiveness. If we, have a, if we sin we have an advocate with the Father, writes John. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. We have one who pleads, intercedes on our behalf. One who will forgive and will restore. One who will strengthen God's people and, and bring them back again and again from the, the bruises of the battle to contend for the faith. And in the midst of all this, they will need that deep sense of what we know as the peace of God. And the Greek word for peace here, Irene, is, is a reflection of the, the Hebrew word shalom. That's a word many of us may have may have let me know. It might be one of the few Hebrew words you know, shalom. But it, that, as we know, speaks not just of, of peace in the sense of calmness, but of a real wholesome sense of well-being in our whole being and our relationship to the Lord. And that's what these folks will need and that's what we will need day by day when the devil is attacking and when people are being difficult, when our faith is under pressure and when maybe we feel sometimes just like giving up. How vital that we make these things mercy, peace, love, things that we pray for one another in the Christian life. Times have not really changed since the days Jude wrote this letter. The same challenges arise for the Christian and the same supply of God's mercy, God's peace and God's love we need today multiplied to us. And of course this final word, just to deal with it briefly, love, agape, the Greek word, is a word you need used very specially in the New Testament that speaks not just of a mere human love or of human friendship or compassion or kindness, but a love that unconditionally reaches out and reaches down to the unlovable and the unlovely and rescues them and keeps them and draws them to the, into the heart of God. It's the love we cannot really get from the world. We only get it through Jesus Christ and by the working of his Holy Spirit in our lives. But when the love with which God has loved us is then manifested in our lives, it shines forth as something that is so very different and so distinctively different from the self-serving, self-seeking attitudes that drive the hearts and minds and motivations of the ungodly. And it is that love of God in Christ that will send us out 
not only to contend for the faith and for the truth of the gospel in the face of unbelief, but will actually give us a heart to win the unbelieving to Christ and to win back the wavering and the struggling and the backslidden from the byroads into which de the devil has taken them back into the arms of God and into the, the firm foundation of their faith in Jesus. There's so much to learn from this little letter of Jude. I trust you'll, you'll join with me each week for a few weeks now as we delve into it. We'll just take a moment to pray as we finish. Heavenly Father, we thank you that these things are our great possession tonight. This mercy of God that does not treat us as our sins deserve, but pardons us, brings us forgiveness, brings us that deep sense of peace with God through Jesus Christ. And that assurance of the love that will not let us go. That love of the good shepherd who not only saves but keeps his people. The good shepherd who laid down his life for us. That we might be delivered from our sins. Thank you that we stand in the good shepherd's love tonight. We who know Christ. And we pray simply that we will experience day and daily the riches of his love. And we'd be reminded day and daily of our calling to live for him and follow him. And of how much the Father loves us. And how assuredly he will keep us till the day he calls us home. Gracious God be with us in all of our needs tonight we pray. And in all that tomorrow will hold. For we ask it in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you again so much for being with me. May God bless you this Wednesday evening.